Hold up. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Social Media United's VA edition. Today, we're going to be talking all about how to manage a Facebook group as a community manager. Facebook groups are one of the best ways to build community online. Business owners may run a Facebook group to start building that relationship with their audience. Typically, Facebook groups will be of two varieties, a free group, which is there to help the business owner begin developing relationships with people that might potentially be interested in using their services. The other type that you will see is a paid group, which is a group that is connecting people that have paid for a course, coaching, or people that have purchased a particular product. Both groups have the potential to greatly benefit a business, and so in this lesson, we're going to go through paid groups and free groups, expectations for each, and your role as a community manager. First up, we're going to talk about free groups. One of the most important things about managing any Facebook group is to be very set on the rules. And so first things first, you want to make sure that you know your, your group rules by heart. And so if you're helping to start a new group, creating group rules immediately will help set the tone for a successful community. You always want to make sure that you have a great working relationship with the group owner, especially if you're starting a new group. And so you want to make sure that you work with them to see what their goals and visions are and to make sure that those rules are aligned with what their goals are. And so those group rules, once they're developed, need to be clearly designated in the description and in the pinned post. So you might be wondering at this point, what kind of rules do you need to start your group? So some of the rules that I recommend are rules about self-promotion, such as can they post a blog post, a link to their website, affiliate links, or anything like that. Second thing is about whether or not you accept get-rich-quick offers. I think for the most part, people don't. Um, but you want to make sure that you're clear before people join that you may not approve of anybody posting their MLM or direct sales offer or anything that might take away from the tone or the mission of the group. Third, you want to make sure that you have a rule about who can PM other members in the group. People are really protective over their Facebook and their Facebook profiles. And so often, whenever there's a member that just goes out of their way to send an unsolicited message to another member, it can be seen as harassing or something that they don't want. And so it can definitely detract from the tone of your group. And so you want to make sure that you're clear from the beginning about whether or not that's something that you allow. I would say for the most part, the groups that I've been in, that is definitely a no. So you wanna make sure that you are crystal clear from the beginning. The fourth type of rule that you'll want to include is a rule about attacking others. This is the internet and Facebook is prime for people to misinterpret or to get into discussions because somebody has a strong opinion about a particular topic. And so you want to make sure from the beginning that you say, this is a free space for people to connect, but it's also a safe space for people to discuss whatever the topic is at hand. So you also want to make sure that you've got rules about whether or not offensive language is going to be tolerated in your group. And you also need to be prepared on the flip side to address if somebody comes in and starts using that kind of language, how you're going to respond as a community manager. Next, you want to make sure that it's crystal clear that this is not a space for people that are coming in to troll. We're actually going to talk a little bit later on about how to handle trolls. And you just want to make sure that they know from the beginning that this is not the place for you. Next up, you want to make sure that you're clear about the types of posts that people are allowed to share in your group. And so you want to make sure that they're not sharing graphic posts or images that were inappropriate and that people don't need to see. You may also want to include a rule about no like for like threads. And so when I say like for like, I mean 
social media, follow me on my blog, or anything like that. Um, the major reason why having a no like for like threads rule is important is because it can clutter the feed. And so we'll talk a little bit later on too about why not cluttering the feed is so important as a community manager. And so you want to make sure that you're clear about what is acceptable for people to do in your group. The next rule you may want to include is one about live video. Especially with the rise of Facebook Live, often members will just feel very free and open to just go ahead and go live in your group. And so you want to make sure that if that's not something that they're allowed to do, that you have a rule so that people know that that's not the place for them to do that. Um, you also want to have a rule about welcome threads. And so you might want to say, once you join the group, you're allowed to make one post and share one link to something that you're working on. Or, you know, you're not, we prefer that you only introduce yourself on a pinned post. And so really one of the basic rules that you want to form is just anything that can clutter the feed. And so when I talk about anything that can clutter the feed, it's really just talking about anything that is going to maybe turn off new members because when they go to their Facebook, like all they see is post after post of something that they're not interested in and is coming from your group. And so that's a really easy way for people to maybe realize that the group is not for them and potentially leave. So as a group moderator, you want to make sure that you're always welcoming new members and it's because it's a great way for you to start building that relationship with them. And so you want to make sure that you work with the group owner to find the best process that works for you. And so it might include allowing new members to create one welcome post or tagging new members on the pen post or taking a period and welcoming new members periodically. And so if you allow a welcome post from a new member, make sure, like we talked about in the previous slide, that you're clear about the rules for that post. And so, as I said before, whatever way that you decide to welcome group members, be sure to include that in your group rules. And so next up, we're going to talk about adding new members. And as your group grows, you're going to be adding new members. And so if you're responsible for adding new members, you'll want to make sure that you set up the screening questions. And the screening questions are new for Facebook, and they're so helpful in making sure that you're adding the right types of people to your group to keep the integrity of your group. And so some of the questions that you might want to ask a new member is something like, how did you find this group? What's your biggest challenge with, and it could be, you know, something that your client has a problem or has a solution to help them solve that problem with. And so you might also want to ask them if they want to join your email list. Um, I know some people are actually using this question a lot to help grow their email list. And so it's kind of a twofer with um, growing a new group, plus also helping build your client's email list. And so you also may want to make sure that they commit to not spamming the group and that they're aware of the rules and that there's going to be certain things that are expected of them if they're going to be a member of the group. And so you may want to also take a look at the questions and decide which questions do they need to answer to be able to enter your group. And so for me, one of the big questions that I feel like every group member needs to answer is something about whether or not they intend to spam or if they can keep, you know, personal posts to themselves. And so if people say no straight up, I most of the time won't add them into the group at all, um, unless maybe I think they just completely misinterpreted the question. But that's one of the best questions for me that will help weed out people that could be a problem in your group. And so I wanted to talk just for a minute about screening new members and why that's important and how to do it appropriately. And so the most important part about adding new members to your group is it helps protect the integrity of the group whenever you do screen them. It may seem more challenging and an extra step for you, but in the long run, whenever you keep someone that could be causing problems in the future out, that it helps you run a smoother, safer group for everyone. And so whenever you're screening a profile to decide whether or not this person should come into your group, 
you may want to check out things as their number of friends, um, number of groups that they're already in. That's a big one because sometimes you'll see crazy numbers, like upwards of like 1,000, 2,000 groups. And so you can tell from that 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 person isn't really there to be a part of that community and that they're simply looking for groups to join for one reason or another. Um, I also like to check out what kinds of groups that they're in. And so sometimes you may find out what they're about simply by the other groups that they're a part of. I like to look at when they joined Facebook to see if it's a new profile. And so if it's a new profile, it may be a valid person, but it also may just be one that somebody created to spam. Um, I also like to check a quick glance of the profile just to make sure that they're somebody that potentially will be interested in contributing to the group. And so really the key just goes all the way back to, are you going to be adding people to the group that are going to help the group thrive? And so you also want to check and see if they answered the screening questions and that may help you decide who belongs in your group and who may not. And so ultimately you can try all of these steps and try to make the best guess possible about whether or not this will be a good fit for your group, but people will always surprise you. Someone that you may think is going to be amazing and add a lot to the group jumps right in and starts throwing up links or things that are not appropriate for the group and then you have to remove them. So these are just some typical tips that you can use to try to make a good educated decision before you let someone into the group. So let's talk just for a moment about special thread days. And so special thread days are something that you may set aside for promos, collaboration, or engagement. The, tip, the key with a thread day is really just for people to interact with each other and for them to be able to get an opportunity to show what they're about. And so you want to make sure that you add the schedule for your promo day. This is one of my favorite tips into your group rules. And so people will know if they're looking for a particular, you know, social media share or something like that, that they can check the group rules and see that that's done on Wednesdays. And it's also helpful so that if someone violates a rule or they try to promo on an off day that you can redirect them back to that post and let them know you know, hey, we let you know at the beginning when you join that these are the promo days. And so you want to take those promo days and you may create a graphic with your client. And you want to try to schedule them through one of the social media management schedulers. It's just easier that way because we all get busy and things happen. And so if you can go ahead and schedule a month's worth of promo post like this ahead of time, you're a lot more likely to make sure that the post posting stays consistent and that you don't end up forgetting something along the way. And so, especially if you use a tool like Buffer, your client can actually sign on as themselves and connect their Facebook profile and you can set up the promo post as them so it doesn't look like you're doing the posting, which is also very helpful. And so on promo days, you want to make sure that you don't just put a graphic out there, but you want to include some guidelines and rules about that particular day. And so you might want to lay out directions such as where you would like that post to be. Is it allowed to be on the group wall or do they need to stick only to that thread? Um, are they allowed to leave their link on a post that they engaged with with someone? Um, that one is really huge because often you will find people say, hey, I liked your post, but now I need you to like mine. And you may also want to talk about what types of content are allowed to be shared. Are you going to allow for a blog post or a social media um, like, or are you going to be allowed to even promo a group in your Facebook group that might drive people out? And so you just want to make sure that you're crystal clear with what the threat is for and what they're not allowed to do so that they can stay in the pace with the rules of the group. And you also want to make sure that you set a really crystal clear deadline for the thread. People will come and posts get bumped up to the top. And so it's super easy for people to see a thread and think, oh, this could be a really great place for me to promo my blog. And they're on the wrong day or it was two days ago. 
And so then it kind of creates another tsunami of people commenting on that post thinking that it's for that day. And so you may also want to consider the location of the members of your group. And so, for example, if a post was due on Monday or was set to go out on Monday, you may have people that it's Monday for them from Sunday all the way to Tuesday. And so you want to be respectful and mindful of the fact that if somebody does post on Tuesday, it could simply be just because that's what day it is for them. It's their Monday. And you want to make sure that you always encourage people to participate. I like to go through groups that do promo days and let them know, you know, hey, I see that you want to share your Facebook page, but that's not the day for it. But I would really love for you to join us on Thursdays when we do Facebook page likes. And it helps them connect with the group. And hopefully they'll come back on that day and share so that they can connect with other people. So one of the best tools that you have as a moderator, and one of my favorite tools, is just to simply turn the comments off. And so the reason why I like this is because it can be a placeholder for you to stop a conversation before it gets out of hand. And so if you are in a thread and it's just getting ugly, you can turn off the comments and take a step back and talk to the group owner and let them know what's going on without necessarily going to the extent of removing the post. And so they may come back and say, hey, you should remove the post, and then you can. But at least you're kind of encouraging people to take a timeout. And you can also use turning off the comments on a promo day thread so that people aren't going over and like constantly bumping up new threads like we talked about in the previous slide. I don't use turning off the comments all the time, but when you do use it, it can be really incredibly effective to help moderate groups. So as a free group community manager, one of the biggest roles that you have is to keep engagement up. And so that can mean different things to your client. And so it may be things such as getting new members to the group, signups to their email list, generating website traffic, or people converting over to buy one of their products or services. And so if you're starting a new group, you're going to need to be in the group often to keep talking with people and getting to know them. The key is making those connections so that people stay engaged in your community and start building relationships so they want to keep coming back to see what's next. And so a more established larger group may need less post creation or people to start conversations. But when you're starting to moderate a larger group, the big thing comes in that you need to be answering more questions and that threads will get lost. a lot faster in a larger group so it's important for you to stay on top of it so that people don't feel like they're sliding through the cracks. So one of my favorite tools for running a group and creating engagement is Post Planner. So Post Planner is a freemium tool. I think plans start anywhere between three and eight dollars depending on what your need is but it comes with quotes, status ideas, and articles that are already proven to be viral. And their status ideas, and you can search by topic, are a great way to get things going in your group. And you can also use their search bar to find viral content that is relative your, to your particular niche or business. One of the things I love to do personally is to take pages or um, different feeds from people that I would maybe consider to be in competition with my client and see what's working for them and what maybe isn't. It's a tremendous tool to figure out what types of content your audience may engage with best. And I also love to use Group Insights. And Group Insights are new, and they're straight on Facebook, and they can help you see how things are going over time. And you may want to use your insights to shout out top contributors to encourage them to keep engaging with your community. People love competition, and so using those insights and shouting those people out may encourage people to keep doing what they're doing, but then it may also encourage people to step up so that they get a shout out as well. One of the biggest rules about being a Facebook group manager is that no thread needs to be left unanswered. And so I say this for a couple of different reasons. And so first of all, I say because of troll prevention. Um, 
one of my favorite mentors used to always say that you've got to hang out in the threads so that people know that mama's always around. And so if people know that you're present in your group and that if they leave a nasty comment or something that they're not supposed to be leaving, if they know you're going to show up, they're less likely to come back and try that again. And so I also say to answer your threads because if you know the answer, don't be afraid to answer it. It's a really great and easy way for you to build relationships with people in your group by being a resource for them on whatever topic your group is about. Google is your bestie. And so don't be afraid to go to Google and find reputable sources that can help you answer whatever question someone may have. And if you don't know, you want to make sure that you bump and see if someone else can help. The biggest key is that people want to make sure that they're heard. And so if they're going to the trouble of creating a post and asking a question, they want to know that somebody saw that. And so even if you say, hey, I don't know this personally and I couldn't find anything, but I'm going to bump it up to see if somebody else knows, at least they know that someone cares enough to try to make sure that they get that question answered. And the other reason why I like to bump up threads is because people may have the same question as well. And so you may frequently see somebody pop on and say, oh good, I had this question too. And so no matter what, it helps you build those connections in your group. So one of the biggest things that you will do as a free group community manager is ban people from your group. So don't be afraid to wield your ban stick because often it can be hard for someone to get a hold of a member personally to let them know something that's going up and especially in a free group and if somebody is just not getting the message and for example they're posting get rich quick schemes I will just go ahead and ban them immediately they're coming in to drop their link and then they're off to the next group to do it again and so they're really not going to notice if I remove them from my group um, I have no problem banning people that link to spam because that puts everybody at risk. And so you need to remove the post and get them out of your group. Um, you also wanna make sure that you are removing people that are promos promoting graphic material. It's not what your members came to your group to find. And so they don't have a place in your group if they're going to keep doing that. And for the most part, if they post one, I'm done unless there's a specific group role of talking to someone beforehand or letting them know, but definitely make sure that you remove the post immediately. And so in a larger group, I'm a lot more likely to do one shrug and you're out. With a smaller group that you're trying to get going, it may be better for you to um, try to talk or reach out to people, but at the end, it just makes you need to make sure that your client okays whatever type of process that you have in place. And whenever I ban or remove somebody from a group, I always like to go into the free group and remind them that this is not a place for spam and that we're here to protect the group and make sure that people can get what they need to out of it. As I mentioned before, one of the other keys is to not clutter the feed. And so when you're starting a new group, you want to make sure that your members are engaged. And so you want to make sure that every post that they see is something that they want to click on and answer or comment or like. And so when they see these threads that are like threads or just posts that are not relevant to the topic, they may be more likely to uh, leave the group and not return. And so if somebody is doing a post that may clutter the feed, such as a like for like thread or a blog follow, I like to pop onto the comments and just remind them that, you know, it looks great, but we have a promo day coming up for that particular topic. So in a free group and often in a paid group, um, people will like to share affiliate links for products that they love or that they sell or posts that they've written. And so you pretty much need a zero tolerance policy here because once one person is allowed to do it, everyone else will try to do it. And so I like to go ahead, if I can, to check out any links that aren't familiar to me or aren't from a particular reputable source to make sure that they actually don't link to somebody else's post. And so 
like I said before, don't be afraid to remind people what your rules are of the group and what's allowed and what isn't allowed. The more that you can say that, especially in a larger group, the more that other people see the post and they get the message. And so at some point in your group, somebody's going to get into an argument. And so as a community manager, when arguments happen, it's super key for you to remain neutral. And so you want to make sure that you take time to remind the parties involved of your group rules and remind them that it's a safe space for people to discuss whatever topic your group is about. And so if need be, you want to remove the posts and potentially remove the members that are involved if they keep violating group rules. And so if things start to escalate to a certain level, you always want to make sure that you touch base with your group owner to let them know what's going on and to make sure that you're handling it in a way that they would like for you to do that. So as a community manager, it can be super easy to get sucked in and want to be online 24-7. And so you may be wondering how often should you really check in? And so you want to be sure to remember that most Facebook groups are worldwide and so people are on all the time. And to kind of counteract with that and make sure that I don't miss important posts, I like to make sure that I adjust my notification setting for that particular group in my Facebook app on my phone. And so if a group gets larger though, the notifications can completely drive you crazy and so you may want to scale that back simply to highlights or something. But the key is to make sure that you're getting notifications of things that are of significance that you may need to address. And so the key is that you want to make sure that you check in often enough that posts aren't getting lost in the feed. Um, because like I said before, you want to make sure that those posts are being answered and people are feeling like they're getting their questions answered and they're getting the help that they're looking for. And so you want to make sure that you're checking in enough that stuff isn't getting lost. And so if you find yourself having to scroll and scroll and scroll to find where you left off, it may mean that you need to maybe add one more time to check in during the day. And so when it comes to new member requests, I always like to try to add new people to a group within at least one business, business day so that they can get going. So now we're going to switch over and talk about paid groups. Paid groups are similar to free groups, but there's a couple of key differences. And so in this section, we're going to talk about handling member requests, removing members, handling customer service as a community manager, when to answer questions versus when to redirect, and what should be in your private messages and what shouldn't. So in a paid group, the dynamics are different because in a paid group, you have members that are paying the group owner for a product or coaching or a course that they're offering. And so any group issues or member issues that you have will definitely need to be addressed more directly, personally, and your communication is going to need to be crystal clear. And like I said before, you want to make sure that people are heard, especially when people are investing their money. They want to make sure that they're getting their money's worth out of whatever product that they're investing in. And so you want to make sure that in a paid group, your focus is on answering questions and being a great resource in the community. And so from time to time in a paid group, you will get member requests. And so it's important that you don't run with every idea that somebody has. And so you want to make sure that you're keeping an open line of communication with your group owner to let them know that somebody has made a request and it's ultimately up to them to decide if a request would be a good fit for the community. And so in a Facebook group particularly, it's so important to be aware of that and to stick with the flow of what your client wants. And so when it comes to actually letting people into the group, you want to make sure that you have a good handle of the rules. And so, I mean, if married people are allowed to join or business partners or people that are, you know, working through the material together, you want to make sure that you have a good handle of how many people are allowed per each purchase. And along with that, you also want to make sure that your screening questions are on. And it's always good to include one about what email address did you sign up with or something like that to make sure that you can actually confirm a purchase was made. And so 
back to the memory quest, I wanted to say again that your job is to build the community that you're currently working in. And so often members will want to take topics or questions or try to create some, another venue for them to discuss the material, which is great. But you want to make sure that you try to keep all communication and conversation in that group as much as possible because the more that that community is thriving, the better off your group owner's business will do. And so you want to make sure that you're trying to keep the communication going, particularly in that Facebook group. And if they decide later on down the road that they want to add something like a Slack channel or something else, that you can help support them in that. But as long as their focus is on the Facebook group, you want to keep things in the Facebook group. Um, removing members. Removing members is a part of any paid group. And so if a member is removed from a group for non-payment, they may decide to reach out to you via private message to ask why they can't access the group. And so it's always best to refer them as much as possible to the main customer service channel that your group owner wants them to use. So it might be an email or it might be contacting them directly. And so you want to make sure that your response is supportive to fixing the issue that they're currently having and so that they're feeling validated, but that they're also getting the answers that they need with no delay. And so something that I like to send people is something like, hi, unfortunately your trial with us has ended. We would love to add you back into the group. And so we would want you to email this email address or visit this link to sign up and we can get you back into, we can work to get you back in the group again. Handling customer service. And so many posts that you will find in a paid group revolve around customer service, such as login issues, payment needing to be updated, or people having trouble accessing the videos. I'm going to say that tagging isn't always best as a community manager. And so when you tag somebody that may be involved in customer support or something like that, it can actually delay the member from getting a response. And so I like to make sure that I've got a swipe file handy so that I know what the proper response should be, whether it's email someone or send a message to someone so that I can answer that question right in that moment without having to tag someone and potentially delay their response. Especially with customer service and the issues that I listed above, it's an issue where they're really feeling like they urgently need help and so the last thing you want to do is delay that response. And so, like I said before, you always want to make sure that you're working with your group owner to find out how to handle those issues. And you, if you're in doubt, you always want to have people email support. Um, that's always going to be the best issue, especially versus things getting lost in a Facebook thread or a private message. So next we're going to talk about when to answer versus when to redirect. You always have to keep your focus on group growth, whether you're in a free group or a paid group. And you've also got to be thinking about what happens when that group hits 1K, 2K, and so on. And so what may be working for you now isn't going to be working for you when the group gets to be larger. And so your job is to support your members, but to not enable them. And so your group owner has gone out of their way to create a product for them and they want their students to be able to use the material. And so you want to make sure that you know that program inside out and that you're able to refer people to content in the curriculum that will help answer their question. And so your job really is to be a brand advocate. And so you need to know what product offerings they have, where to find things in the content as necessary, um, but if you find out that the question that they have is not in the content, like I said before, don't be afraid to Google and see if you can find the answer. And you may not be able to find the answer. And like I said before, just bump up the question and see if somebody else can help them out. Now it's time to talk about your private messages. So once you take on a group admin role, people will private message you, whether it's to get into the group, be removed from the group, cancellations, questions about the group, or questions about whatever topic is at hand. And so one thing I want to say is you don't want to try to manage that in your Facebook Messenger. It may seem really tempting at first because you're in that anyways, but ultimately as your group grows, 
you're going to get more messages and things are going to get lost in translation. And so you want to take your messages that you receive as quickly as possible and you want to try to redirect them as much as possible. And so if it's somebody that's looking to cancel their account, don't tell them that you'll handle it or email or talk to that person in a little bit. You want to make sure that you tell them immediately to email that particular person. And any financial issues that people may be having, you want to make sure that those are all handled over email, especially if you're dealing with any sort of issues about non-payment or not being able to access content. That's just something that's better off in email versus kind of coming into people's personal space and letting them know that there's an issue with their account. And so to wrap it up, um, being a community manager is very rewarding and fun. It's also super fast paced. And so hopefully through this end service, you've been able to take a look at the different expectations that people might have, how to troubleshoot any particular issues that might come up and how to work on building that great community that's going to help you keep engaging and growing in your role as a community manager.